So last time we finished up counterculture, small class today. This is a reflection of how every class goes over. Last time uh, we finished up talking about counterculture and today we are going to move into dealing and the drug war and thus begins an exploration of more scandalous material than we've looked at in the past, where things have gone wrong, where things are kind of tangled, where things are secret and hidden and otherwise. So, um, before we get into that, what are the major club drugs? Drugs that are known as club drugs slash designer drugs. MDMA? What else? There's a bunch. You can even think about what would be used in a club. Oh. Coke? Ketamine? Ketamine? What else? Amphetamine or methamphetamine. Okay, I see amphetamine in the chat. I see acid. Uh, what about inhalants? Poppers. Nitrous, poppers. And I'm thinking of one more that we talked about last time, but this would have been a club drug in the 70s. Quaaludes. Quaaludes, right. Okay, so we have MDMA, quaaludes, ketamine, nitrous, Adderall, slash amphetamine, cocaine, and poppers are the main club drugs. Any remember what the two conflicting groups of British lads that fought each other on a beach and like to do amphetamines were called? Anyone remember these two groups? Joy Boys. <laughs> I hope that that's the name of a real group, but it's not the one that we're referencing. But Joy Boys is an amazing name. <laughs> Um, no, I'm thinking of the mods and the rockers. So we have the mods and rockers who were like the greasers. So it was like the moped boys versus the motorcycle greaser boys. And these guys were the British youths of the day that liked to do amphetamines and sometimes mix them with barbiturates and go to clubs like the Twisted Wheel in Manchester, England. And the music got faster and jazz transitioned into rock and things started tumbling into counterculture from there. What specific event ended the club kid era in New York City in the, in the 1980s. Something happened that really disrupted the club kid community. It was a major scandal. Do we remember what it was? A murder, yes, a murder. Diego, you are on it today. A murder, exactly. A murder of Angel by Michael Alec. And Michael Alec was this hugely influential club kid figure uh, who was just very erratic in his dress and behavior and gender bending and, drug use and ultimately ended up murdering his friend Angel, who was also a drug dealer at Studio 54, a very, very popular club kid club. Who unexpectedly became friends with the Hells Angels? What group of people? I'll give you a hint, they threw a party and invited them. Merry Pranksters. Merry Pranksters, exactly. Do you remember what the Merry Pranksters were known for? Like other than acid? <laughs> well, yeah, yes, I guess so. Well, what specific thing did they do? Or more like activity slash trip did they go on? The, the bus thing. The bus thing, yeah. The further bus, exactly. So they did their acid trip across, well, very literally acid trip across the country um, with Neil Cassidy and Ken Kesey. And Ken Kesey was this guy that or no, it was Neil Cassidy was a guy that crossed over into the beatnik generation. So you're melding Greenwich Village gay and um, mescaline and weed with LSD and cannabis from the West Coast. And they come together in this crazy bus trip that starts the counterculture movement spreading across. That bus is my favorite story ever. Yeah, it's really wild, right? It's really wild. A lot of crazy shit happened on that bus. What event employs principles such as radical self-reliance? Burning Man. Burning Man, yes. And what was the main reasons that drugs started being used in club settings? Specifically drugs. Alcohol. Is it sales were limited or something? Mm-hmm. Well, escape is, I see it in the chat, escapism. But yes, also that clubs stopped selling alcohol as much. Alcohol was no longer as prevalent in club settings, so to work around this, people decided to use certain drugs instead and discovered that depressants actually cut your night short a lot of the time, but stimulants would keep your night going for a lot longer. 
Um, I doubt any of you guys are going to recognize this photo or remember what it is, but on the off chance, does anyone recognize it? Probably not. Opioid, opioid farm for jazz. Yes. Wow. Diego, are you like high as fuck on stimulants yourself today? Because I'm deeply, deeply impressed with how much you've remembered. That is amazing. I wish. <laughs> yeah. So this is the narco farm or the American Addiction, or the, I'm sorry, the Addiction Resource Research Center, <sighs> spit it out. Um, and this was a treatment center that was the first one to recognize addiction as a, as a disease. And most of the major influential jazz performers actually passed through this rehab slash um, rehabilitation center. And many of them as a way of avoiding prison sentences. And the idea was to have people that were struggling with substance use farm and play music and see if it fixed things, which is a great idea, but it didn't work because people would get sent right back into the environments they came from. So further research is needed on this, but as of right now, this would have probably been a great idea if it weren't for the serious systemic problems that prevent it from really working. Anyone recognize where this is? What's happening here? Okay, so that we don't run out of time. That's the Rainbow Gathering. This is the Rainbow Family. Unstructured gatherings, peace, harmony, freedom, no centralized organization. Um, what's on this person's arms? Candy. Candy. Ready. Yes, candy. Some enthusiastic candy offerings. Specifically 3Ds or cuffs in this particular case. You see a side chain, some fat bands, a visor. It's like happy hardcore candy kid, rave kid gear. Okay, let's talk about dealing and the drug war. And we've touched on both of these things in the past, but I want to make sure that we're all caught up on exactly what happens in the drug chain. Because we can't really understand criminalization. We can't understand um, drug laws that persecute people without understanding why those laws exist, how they were formed in the first place, and who they impact. So at the bottom of the supply chain, we have manufacturers and chemists. These are the people where they take the raw materials, they make the thing. And obviously this can come from either farming for the materials, like in the case of opioids from opium, or in the case of synthesizing, like in the case of something like DMT, for instance. And then above them, you have the transporters and the smugglers. And these are the people that move things from place of origin to next place. Um, a transporter is someone that moves things within a region. A smuggler is someone that moves things between boundaries of regions. So a smuggler has the most dangerous job with the lowest payout of all of them because they're the ones that are responsible for sneaking past the majority of law enforcement intended to keep drugs from going from one country to another. Then there are the kingpins or the narco traffickers or the drug lords. These are all words for the same general thing. And these are people who are basically like the brain of the operation. And it makes them very slippery, very difficult to get your hands on. In fact, most people that are drug lords, including mafia leaders like um, El Chapo, actually ended up getting brought down through things like tax evasion instead of, I don't know, orchestrating international drug trade. And that's because they don't actually handle things themselves. They don't really have much of a paper trail because they just delegate activities. They're like, okay, well, we're sourcing this manufacturer or this grower to work with this chemist, to work with this smuggler, to work with this transporter, to work with these like housers, to work with these dealers. So when you see drug lords slash narco traffickers slash kingpins, the reason they get so powerful is because they monopolize the trade. And we'll look more at that in a second. I just like inhaled some chocolate, so I keep moving. And then there are the dealers or the traffickers. They're known as both of those things. Um, and they're basically the people that you know and love as your friendly neighborhood drug dealer, right? So they get their stuff passed down to them through one way or another, and sometimes that's through the dark net, and sometimes that's through connections in person. But either way, these are the people that ultimately are the face of the drug trade, even though they're pretty much at the very bottom of this command. So the, the name trafficker is ambiguously someone that moves and distributes drugs. It can refer to someone at the top of the, the hierarchy or at the bottom of the hierarchy. It kind of depends. Support small businesses. Mom and pop shop. So manufacturers would be either growers, so the people that actually establish and grow and harvest the plants, or chemists. And as you can see, there's a wide variety 
in the kind of situations and locations that chemists might operate in. A very wide variety and quality control here, and you will never know which one your drugs came from. Now, to give you an idea of why this is really important to know about and why this is actually really, 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 really critical to the global economy, we want to take a look at the Taliban. So in Afghanistan in particular, in Pakistan, the opium trade, as with many other countries, which we'll look at a little bit later today, fuels the economy of war. And this is how it happens. Looks like I'm using an ad blocker. One time I accidentally kind of went on a date with one of the editors of Politico in, New in uh, DC, but it wasn't really a date. You met on a kick, you can. Anyway, the US the government <laughs> spent more than a decade fighting a war in a way that many people said was just, we were fighting the wrong war. We were fighting the terrorists instead of the drug traffickers who, without the traffickers, the terrorists wouldn't have existed. I'm Josh Meyer, senior investigative reporter at Politico, and I worked on a story about the global heroin trade in Afghanistan and a law enforcement effort called Operation Reciprocity. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. After the 9-11 attacks, the U.S. government went into Afghanistan, toppled the Taliban, and got rid of Al-Qaeda and its training camps. What they didn't expect was that the Taliban would come roaring back and that they would use drug money, potentially billions of dollars of it, uh, to finance an insurgency that grew and grew and grew to the point where it threatened to take out the whole government. The Afghan government that the U.S. government had spent almost a trillion dollars supporting and basically take over the country. One of the big contradictions in this is the Taliban derives a lot of its legitimacy from the fact that it's their holy warriors for Islam. And so uh, drugs are forbidden in Islam. And so one way that they've tried to reconcile that is by saying that we are only trafficking in drugs to take on the great Satan, which is the United States. The problem is that as they've continued to expand the drug trade in Afghanistan, we now have potentially millions of Afghans who are addicted to drugs because of it. Same thing in Iran and Pakistan and Russia, everywhere where the trafficking routes go from Afghanistan. And Afghanistan has been on the verge of becoming a narco state on and off for 10 years, everybody from the local. Just to be clear, a narco state is a government that is controlled by the drug trade. Farmers who are growing poppy in their fields uh, to the transporters, uh, to the people that are processing the heroin. And you can refine that into morphine, into heroin and other products that, that are sent around the world. When the drug money takes over the democratic institutions, the police, the politicians, uh, if they're in the control of the drug lords, that's when you get a narco state. That's what Afghanistan has become in the eyes of some of its critics. And that's what the DEA was trying to stop. Operation Reciprocity was a DEA investigation in which they decided to do was do a giant conspiracy case and go after all of the drug lords that they thought were the ones involved in financing the insurgency. It's kind of a decapitation strategy where they wanted to cut the head of the snake off and kill the insurgency that way. Something like that did had success in Colombia, it's had success elsewhere. Untrue, and we'll come back to that in a second. Operation Reciprocity, for all intents and purposes, died on May 27, 2013, when Tina Cadenow, who was the Deputy Chief of Mission in Afghanistan, found out about it. Welcome to the podium, Tina Cadenow, today. She summoned three officials that were involved in Operation Reciprocity to her office, told them to shut down the operation immediately. Operation Reciprocity was uh, done in coordination with the broader Obama administration. Okay, we don't have to get too deep into that. So the Taliban obviously is a force to be reckoned with, right? And the fact that we see this massive insurgency that is rooted in and grows economically from the drug trade should really say something about the power of the drug trade, but it also should make us question. If this entire economy is growing so rapidly right now, what exactly is, is driving this economy? What exactly is driving this huge amount of sales that can come from something like opium poppies? And is it because we have prohibition worldwide that makes opium something that can and will be produced illicitly and traded illicitly? If we had a regulated market, would the Taliban be able to control this market with such ease? 
or would the people operating under it potentially have more protections afforded to them and not necessarily be at risk of being held at gunfire? So moving on to meth labs real quick. Um, rural America is ripe with rolling meth labs and clandestine meth labs, basically illegal meth labs, right? So a rolling meth lab is one that takes place in a vehicle. And this is quite dangerous for a lot of reasons. Um, in these, these bottles, you can see materials for what would be known as shake and bake, which is where you combine your materials into some kind of a bottle, like a plastic container, and you shake it and release the pressure occasionally and shake it to create your chemical reaction. But the issue with this is that if you're not letting off that pressure often enough, it can explode. In fact, shake and bake explosions and other explosions from clandestine meth labs have caused people to need massive skin grafts that have left them permanently disfigured um, from the force of the explosions. Man, that all adds a whole new level of Talladega Nights. So this DIY attitude is very prevalent in the Dakotas in particular and other areas in that region of the United States where a lot of people will just be like, well, I could just make my own, like I don't need to buy this elsewhere. So a lot of the meth that's produced in the US comes from those regions. And a lot of it does come from Mexico as well. Northern Mexico produces a pretty sizable quantity of the meth that comes to the US. But these chemicals are toxic and they're volatile and they're prone to explosion, right? Um, now, if we're looking at smugglers specifically, kind of moving around the supply chain here, because that's an example of a chemist, basically, or a chemist as much as you might want to say that. Um, smugglers get very creative. I don't even know what this chair is. I think that it's just like a rocking armchair. But people pack stuff against their calves and into furniture. There are all kinds of things that can be used to smuggle stuff, obviously. But only around 10 to 15% of the stuff that's smuggled is actually intercepted. So we are spending a lot of time and money and energy attempting to, oh yeah, it does look like a car seat or I don't know, it's got a footrest. That's a really fancy car seat. Um, maybe it's like one of those bassinet things that you hold baby in. I've never seen baby before, I'm not sure. So we have this huge budget for attempting to stop smuggling, attempting to stop product from coming to the United States, but only 10% or so of what comes in is actually caught. And there's a lot coming in. But the smugglers are often the people that get the most fucked by this process, honestly, because you are doing such a high risk thing. You're dealing with international organizations, you're dealing with moving across borders into foreign countries where the criminalization could be different. And all of this is because in some countries, it's easier to make and access materials than in other countries. So for instance, looking at meth labs, whoops, pseudoephedrine, which used to be available in higher concentrations over the counter. Some of you might remember Sudafed, the nasal decongestant. People would buy mass quantities of Sudafed, which contains um, ephedrine, which is one of the precursors for methamphetamine, just crush up the pills and all of a sudden you have materials. So in some countries it's easier to get ephedrine than others. And that continues to be the case. So that's part of what causes this. Now, to kind of see how this has gotten a little bit crossed in the past, I think Stewie from Family Guy was trying to get sued of it. <laughs> that wouldn't surprise me. There was this thing that happened in the 70s called the French Connection. And as with many things that have happened with the United States, this was a scandal, the CIA in particular. In 1970 something, I forget which year exactly, um, the CIA came into contact with French heroin manufacturers. The Port of Marseille was at risk of becoming communist controlled slash communist oriented and the CIA, because this was during the Red Scare, really didn't want that. So they made a deal effectively with French heroin distributors and manufacturers saying, we're going to look the other way while you do your thing as long as you help us fight communism in the Port of Marseille. And this went on for a little bit, and then the U.S. government was like, okay, that's enough of that. Never mind. Like, if the deal's off, stop doing your heroin thing with the United States. Like, we're no longer going to look the other way, whatever. But these connections had already been made, and it was discovered that there were tons of heroin that had been stored in the NYPD locker that had been brought in by the mafia and the NYPD had been allowing them as a bribe, allowing them to store um, massive quantities, $70 million of heroin in their storage rooms. 
And this was called the French Connection. This was this whole thing where the CIA was like, yeah, go ahead, like do your thing, we won't look. And then they established a relationship with the United States and law enforcement, and it was exploited very, very heavily. Now, in the meantime, there was this dealer named Frank Lucas, who was a kingpin, a heroin kingpin, and his claim was that he brought in heroin during the Vietnam War in the cadavers and coffins of dead Vietnam War soldiers. This was the claim that he made. But strangely enough, this has been refuted by one of his partners who was like, no, that would be really fucking morbid. We just hollowed out teak furniture and shoved packages in there. So we're not positive why Frank Lucas spread this rumor, but he actually was brought down for dealing and smuggling heroin when two massive packages of heroin ended up at the houses of two elderly black women who were very confused and called the police. And after that, he started telling this story about bringing back heroin in Vietnam War coffins. And remember that Vietnam War saw a huge spike in heroin use in the United States because it was more easily accessible in Vietnam. So going back to kingpins now, right? The narco traffickers, traffickers, drug lords, kingpins, whatever you want to call them, these are the guys that arrange the hits. They identify the people that need to be killed because they're about to talk. They communicate between different facets of the dealing chain and supply chain, and they're extremely wealthy. But they're also sometimes extremely benevolent in weird ways. And this is partly because most narco traffickers come from extreme poverty. Part of the reason that narco traffickers arise in the first place is that they live in communities that have been devastated financially. And oftentimes, um, like for instance, El Chapo, I think I said El Chapo is a mafia boss earlier. I just realized that it was definitely not, it was maybe Al Capone. It was Al Capone, not El Chapo. Um, but El Chapo was actually known as being like very charitable within his, his communities. Many of these narco traffickers have actually built huge community centers and funded community projects and infrastructure with their millions and billions and whatever of dollars. Um, however, they also kill a lot of people, so it's kind of like, <laughs> you kind of take what you can get, you know? Now, going down to the most local level, sometimes you have guys like this who just post pictures of themselves on social media platforms and assume that they're not going to get taken down eventually, which they are. Pro tip, don't use Snapchat for your drug deals. Just stop using social media for drug deals. That is so stupid. Please just use an encrypted messaging platform or like phone calls or anything with social media. But most of these dealers are just like making very little profit. And these are the absolute vast majority of the people that are incarcerated. Um, well, no, people are mostly incarcerated for possession, for buying drugs, not for selling drugs. It's mostly just possession that is criminalized and that is taken advantage of for criminalization. But a lot of smaller dealers attempt to rise up through the ranks. So for instance, in Detroit, there are some dealing circles where um, foot dealers can gain more of a position and like leverage themselves up through time, but the pay is very poor. You have to work very hard and you are sticking your neck out every single day. And then there are the users. And this is a word that I encourage you to use kind of lightly here. Um, is that user is often a very derogatory term. And also I wanna point out the fact that just because I'm, I've used these two images in this slide, these should not play in your mind as the stereotypes of the, the demographics that would use these kinds of substances. In fact, I would actually say that it's typically a role reversal. It would be the white man from the United States who would be smoking opioids. And it would probably be someone in the Middle East who was smoking weed <laughs> comparatively or Southeast Asia who is smoking weed. Um, that's probably more accurate, frankly, like poor white Americans represent the majority of the opioid user base. Um, but these are the people that pay the highest prices for substances that are at the lowest quality by the time they reach you. They could have been stepped on slash passed down slash cut, all means the same thing, what, five, 10, 15, 20, 30 times? You never know. If you're lucky enough to get something that's close to the source, it might've been cut like three times. So a lot of these major traffickers made substantial amounts of money. So for instance, Freeway Rick Ross or Freeway Ricky was an extremely famous Coke dealer in the 1980s. Oops, it always does that, it's so annoying. So just, I just want this to sink in real quick. Not, not by itself. 
according to some some articles I looked up, I looked up, and you can tell me whether this is accurate or not. It said that you were making up to three million dollars a day. I've had days that I made three million. You had a three million dollar day. Yeah. Okay. A few of them. A few of them. Explain how you have a three million dollar day. Well, your big customers come through, a couple of them, and they drop off two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars. There were uh, three or four spots that I had in LA where guys that stood out on the street that would make a hundred thousand dollars a day each one. Each one. Yeah. Now this actually built up. I guess you had operations in 42 cities? I don't know how many cities. I mean, a lot of cities. We had a lot of cities. All throughout the country. Yeah. So, so explain to me, and okay. You know, different people do their estimates and their calculations yeah. and, and all right. that stuff. So, um, and, and I guess the, the other thing is that you moved $900 million worth of cocaine. Or more. Or more. Which in today's dollars is the equivalent of two point five billion dollars. Two point five billion dollars of cocaine moved. That's a lot of money. So what happens when we put all of this together, right? Like what happens when we create a hotbed, an environment where it not only is extremely profitable to run an operation where you are participating in the illicit drug trade, but also is an easy means comparatively of addressing or even escaping from poverty and also becomes territorial dominance because other people have the same idea. This is what brought us cartels. Now I know that probably all of you, hopefully all of you, are familiar at least slightly with cartels and as someone that has spent almost all of my life living about half an hour away from the US-Mexico border, I certainly am very familiar with cartels. Cartel violence is just common in terms of conversation with anyone that's remotely interested in anything happening with the border conflict um, in San Diego, where I'm from. And a cartel is an operation that I think is frequently misunderstood and also is frequently generalized to mean Mexico. This is a problem. We need to stop lumping cartels in with Mexico. They are completely separate entities in terms of Mexican citizens versus, or Mexican occupants versus cartels. And governmentally, this does become an issue, as we'll see a little bit, because sometimes the line between cartel and government gets blurred in Mexico. And this is a really big issue that they're facing right now. But this was born because of one thing, America. America birthed cartels. And I will tell you exactly how, and I will prove this point to you. But first, let's figure out what a cartel is exactly in case you are not aware. Um, most cartels started out as being very large and there were a couple cartels that were extremely powerful and widespread. The Sinaloa cartel, for instance, Los Cedas. But then through time, as the kingpins for those major cartels started getting incarcerated or the cartels started breaking up for one reason or another, they split off into a bunch of smaller groups, which is actually a bigger issue than having a couple of major cartels that are monopolizing the industry because these smaller groups engage in turf wars, extremely, extremely violent turf wars that usually involve citizens and acts of terror. So at the top, you have the drug lord or the kingpin, who's obviously the overseer. Then you have the second in command, the lieutenant. The hitmen are the murderers in the operation. And then there are the falcons, who are basically the undercovers that keep a watch on everything. And we'll come back to cartels in a little bit, but I want to give kind of an overview of criminal organizations. So in the 1920s, when the Volstead Act was implemented and prohibition became a thing and bootleg moonshine became a thing, the American Mafia was also born because of prohibition, right? The whole idea behind prohibition was alcohol is causing violent, like domestic violence and depraved acts. And like, yes, those things were true. Alcohol was causing a lot of social problems. But what they found was that the Volstead Act made violence overall go up, not because alcohol was no longer present, but because people were fighting to make alcohol present again. So, this just became this total unexpected consequence 
and speakeasies were like the original underground rave <laughs> in a lot of ways because they created a three billion dollar underground market and that in today's currency is a fat quantity of money this is a huge amount of money that was used to create alcohol to spur in this or to uh, spur not spur in this market i've been saying that word wrong my entire life so Al Capone, otherwise known as Scarface, was one of the guys in the, the Italian-American mafia. And it should be known that a mafia, even though it's known as a family, wasn't necessarily actually all people that were related, but rather people that were living in demographic ghettos at the time. So the Italian-American mafia was an extremely prevalent one. Um, and Al Capone drastically increased their output, but he was also very popular. He was known for being very charitable. He was Robin Hood. And this is an interesting comparison to today's current narco-traffickers and kingpins who are also known as Robin Hoods in many capacities. Um, on St. Valentine's Day, or there was a St. Valentine's Day massacre, which was part of a turf war, and like seven or eight people were killed in broad daylight, and then he wasn't very popular anymore. But he was another guy that went down for tax evasion, and I think actually died in prison due to illness. Now, this is really all over the place. I should have looked at this and restructured this. Going back to cartels, <clears throat> I guess. <clears throat> so South America has been suffering from cartel violence since the beginning. This is not an isolated issue to the United States. Cartels are domestic terror or terrorist organizations. They are extremely bloody. They cause a lot of very serious problems. In fact, um, Honduras has I think it's not the highest murder rate in the world at this point anymore, but it had one of the highest murder rates in the world. Um, about 80% of the cocaine that goes to the United States goes through Honduras. These things are directly traceable to regions. Wherever the drugs are pushed through, the murder rates and the violence rates go way higher. And the segregation, the poverty segregation gets way more intense as well. But we see this like huge spike in homicide rates wherever the drugs are going, right? In Mexico, for instance, um, the homicide rate was actually going down drastically. But then something happened in 2007. In 2007, the Mexican government decided that they were going to start getting involved, start getting involved in the drug trade again and using military force to try and cu cut off the drug trade. Previously, they'd been kind of like, not using military force to enforce this, and things hadn't been going perfectly, but the murder rate wasn't crazy high. But in 2007, as soon as they decided to start getting involved again, people started dying because the military was sent in and the cartels militarized, they mobilized against them. Then all the tactics started changing, and Colombian cartels started getting involved in using submarines to transport drugs. So now we have things going in the ocean and in planes and over the border in people's like body cavities sometimes. And then there were unexpected consequences of this as well. This is Manuel. And if you wanna read more about this guy in the um, presenter notes of this slide, there's a link to this project that tracks people like Manuel. In Puerto Rico, there are is a lot of stigma around people that use opioids. And there's also a lot of misunderstanding and there's also a crisis with the number of people that are using opioids as well in some regions, at least at this point in time. Um, Manuel went to Puerto Rican authorities and said, I need help. And they said, you should go to Chicago. There's a rehab group here that will help you. And he paid all of the last of his money and went to Chicago. And when he arrived there, there was an empty room with no bed and no furnishings and other people that had been sent there as well that were falsely promised help in an empty house, basically. So immigrants are being sent across the border into the United States with a promise of treatment because the government doesn't want to deal with them anymore. Now in Colombia, there are a whole bunch of cartels that have been around the Medellin cartel, the Norte de Valle cartel, the Cali cartel. All of these cartels have been massively powerful. In fact, so powerful that in the 90s, the government was less powerful than the cartels. The cartels could have overthrown the government. And at some point, actually, I, I believe that there was a cartel that actually stormed a courthouse and took some judges hostage because they were just powerful. Oh my God, <laughs> just powerful enough to do it. In the 70s, 
They imported 500 pounds of weed into Florida through this crazy operation that we'll look at a little bit later. But there's something that's been happening in Colombia that I bet that almost none of you are aware of, a massive, massive internal conflict that's been taking place since the 70s. Now, recently, Colombia is not producing as much of its cocaine as it used to be, because Colombia is where a lot of the cocaine originates from. But there's a reason for this, and it's not necessarily that good of a thing because cocaine production is still very high. It's just happening in other places, and things are happening as a result of us trying to reduce the cocaine production. I know this sounds a little vague, but I'll explain it in a second. This is one of the most roiling conflicts in the world that most people have no idea is going on. And I'll just let you guys see it, actually. When you think of landmines, countries like Afghanistan, Sudan, Iraq, and other conflict areas around the world might come to mind. But Colombia is one of the most affected countries in the world, too. Because for the last 50 years, there's been a roiling conflict between leftist Marxist guerrillas and the Colombian government. And even though there are peace talks happening right now in Havana, the legacy of decades of war are literally sown into the soil. So we came to Colombia to find out how this nation is dealing with this ongoing, violent, and brutal problem. Since 1990, there have been over 10,000 landmine victims in Colombia, the second most in the world behind Afghanistan. Many victims are poor farmers and ranchers who live in regions controlled by the guerrilla or other narco-trafficking groups that operate in the country. But the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC, has been the government's main enemy. And even after over $5 billion in U.S. military aid, around 7,000 FARC soldiers are holding off over 300,000 Colombian troops by surrounding themselves with landmines, their strongest line of defense. FARC has been around for five decades. And what began as a Marxist people's army fighting against capitalist imperialism has devolved into a guerrilla force that threatens the very people it originally sought to protect because of the thousands of landmines they've buried in civilian areas. Es el terror eh, que forma las FARC en los campos colombianos, colocando minas al lado de las escuelas, al lado de las trochas, al lado de los caminos por donde pasa la población civil. Los bandidos han encontrado. Eh, en las minas, eh, un asesino enterrado, un asesino muerto, que queda por siempre hasta que algún hombre de las fuerzas militares o de la población civil lo active. Over the last six months, FARC leaders have been negotiating peace with Colombia's government. But even as they talk about ending hostilities, there's no ceasefire in place. Now, as of a couple of years ago, there was a treaty that was signed. I actually haven't been as up to date on this as I would like to be. Where are they getting all these landmines? Are they capturing from the government forces? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm actually not sure how feasible it is to DIY it and make them themselves. I wouldn't be surprised if that's something that's happening because you can make a bomb using battery acid. Um, as of a couple of years ago, I think a year and a half ago, peace treaties had been signed, but the United States government was showing no sign of letting up its involvement in this process. So the TLDR of what happened here is that, um, in the 70s, it was the 90s, it was the 90s, um, there was a guerrilla movement, a Marxist communist movement that wanted to overthrow a very, very right-wing government. And initially this was to protect the people, but ultimately both the paramilitant groups, the very right-wing conservative groups, and the Marxist groups started using similar tactics of terror. So they really blended together, and this was ongoing for 20 odd years. I think, if I remember the numbers correctly, approximately 800,000 people have been displaced from Colombia, which is the second highest number of displaced people in the world behind Afghanistan. Or is it Saudi Arabia? It's one of those two. I think it's Saudi Arabia. And um, around 200,000 of those are children. So I want you to see exactly what this looks like in action. Things like feces and battery acid. So if you're lucky enough to survive a mind blast, you'll likely suffer lasting effects of the injury. Yo me encontré en una pila. Mauricio me dijo, ay, queremos los arreos. Yo le dije, no, es un quieto a mí. Y Mauricio cogió una piedra y la tiró. O sea, cuando miré, miré una humarada, arena y hojas que se levantaron. 
todo cambió porque si no allá es mi hija ya. Me montaron el potrillo y duré media hora para arriba bueno, en el potrillo. Tuvimos tres horas en, en moto y, y en San José. Entonces, esto es Tengo, digamos así, tripas plásticas, eh, el intestino como que me falta <ríe> y, y el hígado me falta también. Now the Medellin cartel in the 70s and 80s, um, this was the, the big boy, right? Like the Pablo Escobar and Griselda Blanca were the two main leaders of the, the Medellin cartel. And at some, at some points they were making $60 million a day importing cocaine to the United States. And these were the guys that were possibly involved in storming the Supreme Court and taking hostages. Now, I guess we don't really need to show this, but the TLDR is that there were some insiders effectively that came to the cartel and were like, we know how to get you into Florida, which became a main point of entry for cocaine because it was the closest to a lot of the, the coastal cities of South America. And they would fly a cargo plane, a little cargo plane, onto this tiny island that was right between the borders, like right outside of jurisdiction. And then they would swap out all of the materials onto a larger plane and fly it into Florida. And that was how they got most of the cocaine in through that route. So Pablo Escobar was, again, very generous. He was, again, a bit of a Robin Hood with his income, despite the fact that he hired a lot of hitmen to kill a lot of people, um, hundreds if not thousands of people, and he was worth around $3 billion. And he was one of the bribery lords, Pablo Escobar. And there was Griselda Blanco, who was the godmother of cocaine, and she was behind what became known as the cocaine cowboys. So in the 80s in Miami, it became commonplace to have broad daylight drive-by shootings, which really instilled fear in people. This was like motorcyclists would come by and they would shoot people in shopping malls, etc. And this really made the name of the Medellin cartel become extremely notorious. And Blanco herself is known as the White Widow. I believe she killed multiple of her ex-husbands, but I don't, I, I want to make sure that I'm right on that, but I'm pretty sure she killed a couple of her ex-husbands. So there were other cartels like the Gulf Cartel and Los Zetas and the Sinaloa Cartel, which I think is the largest one at this point in time. Um, but now we have this just network of all of these cartels operating on their own basis and they all are trying to gain territorial dominance in Mexico. They're all trying to get control over the drug trade. If there were no prohibition, there would be no control over the drug trade because it would be a regulated market. Now, unfortunately, I don't think Cartel Land is on Netflix anymore, so I need to update this. If you have the opportunity to, I highly recommend you watch it. It is one of the most important documentaries that I've ever seen. It is my most highly recommended documentary in terms of drugs and understanding the drug war and its impacts on civilians. Let me make this clear. The people that are suffering most from cartel violence are innocent Mexican civilians. Again, this is just another case of United States selfishness. The fact that we attribute cartel violence as being something that the United States needs to fear more than anything, while not taking any responsibility for have created the markets that drive cartel violence in the first place. It's on Amazon? Okay, that's good to know. But yes, cartel land, extremely important documentary to watch. And it should be noted that a lot of these acts of extreme brutalism are displays of force. This is marking territory. This is going into small communities and establishing dominance and threatening families. And this is a terror that is experienced by many families in rural Mexico. The Sinaloa cartel, I believe is still currently the most powerful cartel in the world. Um, at some point it got fragmented into smaller bits, but it has distribution points all the way across the United States. El Chapo has escaped from prison multiple times. He's the guy that heads this cartel. And um, they've recently started bringing higher quantities of fentanyl as well as heroin into the United States, partly because 
cannabis has become more available in the US, so it's a less profitable crop now. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to skip through this. I believe, if I remember correctly, that El Chapo was actually declared to be um, like public enemy number one in Chicago, even though he'd never been to Chicago, if I remember correctly. So taking a look at some trades real quick, I um, just want to see how this stuff circulates around the country. There are two main areas that opium are produced, the Golden Crescent and the Golden Triangle. So in the Middle East and Southeast Asia, and a lot of the times the people that are bringing opium and heroin products um, across international borders are US troops, the army in particular. Now, in some countries like Myanmar, this is a huge pillar of the economy. And a major problem has been occurring where in Myanmar, a lot of the time the government will send in representatives to be like, you can't grow these crops here to poor farmers and they'll destroy the crops. And then the farmers will be like, we don't know what to do and replant the crops. And it's just the cycle over and over and over and over again. There was a really excellent panel about this by a representative from Myanmar that spoke about this at a conference that I was at last year who mentioned this issue of like continuous replanting and destruction. We have spent a lot of fucking money on the war on drugs. We've spent trillions of dollars on the war on drugs. And this money has just been increasing and increasing and increasing. And it started, as you can see, right around 1986, approximately. This is when things really started taking off. Now, at this point in time, we're spending billions of dollars per year on the war on drugs. But despite this, we see that the actual rate of substance use problems and addiction has stayed relatively steady throughout the course of this time. And granted, yes, it has gone up recently due in part to the opioid crisis and benzo crisis, but it's not, it's not skyrocketing in conjunction with the amount of money that we've been spending. So why did this happen in the first place? Why did we start doing this? Now, I mentioned this briefly in the past, but 1906, um, the Negro cocaine fields. This was a New York Times article that was released that basically was like, as per usual in these kinds of newspaper publications, black men will rape your wives. This is just like over and over and over again in publications. This was the message that was getting driven across. And this helped initiate this demonization of not only drugs, but the people who used them. And again, this is stuff that we've kind of looked at a little bit in the past but we have Prohibition, and then we have Harry Enslinger, one of the most notorious names in drug history, who pushed this concept that initially there was no such reason to believe that cannabis was dangerous, and then started calling it marijuana and saying that um, it was affiliated with depraved behavior used by people of color in particular. And violence just kept going up in response to Prohibition, so they switched gears and started prohibiting a drug that was not as commonly used by white people. Now, we're not gonna look at that. The war on drugs was, actually, are we gonna look at this? No. Public. No, we're not going to, sorry, that's so loud. Um, the war on drugs was really started largely by Nixon, right? Nixon was the one that declared um, drugs to be public en enemy number one in 1971. And there's a statement that we'll look at in a minute by his right-hand man about the reason for this. Now, a lot of the time people attribute this to being partly due to the fact that so many soldiers are coming back from the Vietnam, Vietnam War struggling with morphine and heroin addictions, but that's only a part of it, right? There's more to it than that. Now, this is a quote from Richard Nixon's right-hand man, like his number one guy, and he was imprisoned, right? So this was a quote that was released after he was already convicted. And here's what he asked. I think to say I shared this. this story with you some time ago, but it's and now quoting John Ehrlichman. This was Richard Nixon's right hand man. Quote The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti war left and black people. You understand what you what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or to be black. 
But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then heavily criminalizing both, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. That's a quote. Enter Nancy Reagan. Looking like a snack. Well, drugs don't concern me, but it does concern you. It concerns us all because of the way it tears at our lives and because it's aimed at destroying the brightness and life of the sons and daughters of the United States. Now, this is another huge tactic that was employed was affiliating drug use with corruption of the youth, of corruption of purity in particular. This notion of purity as being a thing that America has ever had, as being destroyed somehow <laughs> by drugs, was drilled home in the Just Say No program, in Nixon's speeches, and in his movements against substances. And we'll come back and see exactly what Nixon did to try and enforce this and try and reiterate this concept and how the Nixon administration perpetuated and started the war on drugs. The Reagan administration was what really got the ball rolling. And this is how it happened. Was, I know this graph is a little bit hard to read. It was the prison population. This is 1986, right around the Just Say No program starting, and this was when incarceration started skyrocketing. This was when they added bite to this campaign. The purpose behind the Just Say No campaign and the reason that Reagan pushed so hard on a, a tough against crime platform was because Nixon set a precedent that you had to set a tough against crime platform because there was so much fear happening during the Red Scare and the Cold War and the United States wanted some kind of assurance of strength and like toxic masculinity and all of these barriers that could be put up against outside destructive forces. And what better way to make the American people feel secure than by identifying something other than themselves that was the source of their problems. So drugs were very convenient in this time period. And you can, I mean, easily see here the, the discrepancies among prison populations, which is something that we'll look at a lot more in depth next week. But for the time being, just keep this in mind. Now, I want to introduce you to one of the most mind-boggling injustices ever. This is, this is something that is, I think, one of the starkest examples of how the drug war is so racist and so blatantly ineffective that I hope that you use this as ammunition in future conversations. So in 1984, 1986, that time range, when crack fever became a thing and things like crack horror and crack baby became buzzwords and crack head, which as I mentioned in the past is a racial slur because it was used specifically in reference to low income black communities, crack cocaine and powder cocaine had completely different sentencing to possess five grams of crack cocaine, to have, that five grams of, of crack cocaine is like this much crack, to have this much crack in your possession for personal use is punishable by a minimum of five years in prison. Possession with intent to distribute 500 milligrams or 500 grams of cocaine, 500 grams of cocaine, is punishable by the same minimum sentence. Now, this was this concept of mandatory minimums. This was a 100 to 1 sentencing disparity, 100 to 1 ratio, okay? Owning five grams of crack, punishable in the same exact way as dealing 500 grams of cocaine. And what's even crazier about that is that if you think about how crack is made, it's got a lot of baking soda in it, so it's really only a couple grams of cocaine in there and some baking soda. What's being criminalized? What exactly is being criminalized? Black Are news. Are you criminalizing smoking? Are you criminalizing baking soda? What are you criminalizing? This is so obvious. It took until the Obama administration. What is that, 40 years, like 30 years? 30 years of 100 to 1 sentencing disparity here until the Obama administration rolled it back to a 17 to 1 ratio. 
Now looking at this, black Americans comprise approximately the same percentage of the overall drug user demographic as white Americans, maybe less, but they're 13 times more likely to be arrested at the state level. 13 times. So did the drug war work? No. This is an easy one. And this isn't even just me being biased. This is economics. This is quantitative. This is numbers. The problem with how we look at the drug war is that we look at it based on the emotion involved. We look at it from a moral perspective of, well, we need to make sure that people aren't doing things that cause them harm. And, you know, I understand that. You want to protect your neighbors. You want to protect your family. You want to protect yourself. Like, sure, I get that. We're in an individualistic society. It makes sense. But does it work? And people don't want to look at whether or not it actually works because the cognitive dissonance of that, seeing the separation between your perceived reality and actual reality is hard. Since 1975, 82% of nationally surveyed high schoolers have said that weed was easy to find and that number has not changed. Over 500 economists have put together a letter saying explicitly, due to the basic principles of supply and demand, there is no way for this to work. In fact, it benefits cartels because it makes the risk ratio higher, but it also makes the reward higher. So cartels get a lot more bang for their buck. They can charge whatever they want and people will pay it. Drugs are not like other things in the economy. People will pay whatever the cartels charge. And this doesn't even factor in incarceration. This doesn't even factor in the lives that have been lost to violence, the number of years that have been lost to lost productivity from people that have been suffering from problematic drug use who haven't been able to seek treatment, from people who have been maimed or killed, from the cartel wars, from poverty, from like government intervention, from being shot as an unarmed black person for possession. The war on drugs is a war on people. I will say it over and over and over again, but more specifically, the war on drugs is an unending cycle of poverty, incarceration, social stigma, being outcast, lack of education, disinformation. Let's say you have someone that's working a blue collar job. Let's say that this person happens to smoke weed. Let's say that this person happens to be detained by a cop for some random reason. The cop searches them, finds weed on them, incarcerates them for possession. Let's say that this person does time. They come out. They have a, they have a, a thing, oh my God, a criminal record. They have a criminal record for possession. They have to show this criminal record when they apply to jobs. It gets harder to get jobs. It gets harder to get paid. Poverty levels increase. Housing insecurity increases. Mental health goes down in quality. Can't get access to health care because you don't have as much access to work anymore. What do you do, self-medicate? What else are you gonna do? The cycle continues, generational trauma ensues. There is so much evidence showing that if you are traumatized, deeply traumatized, your DNA changes, your children are more susceptible to mental illness. This creates entire generations of people that struggle from issues that entirely stem from one person being incarcerated for possession. Whole communities towns struggling from this. Once you're impoverished, you got court fines. You have probation. You have to pay for your ankle monitoring device. You have to pay for your pee tests. Everything is paid. Your voter rights are stripped. You can't even advocate for yourself in the eyes of the law. And because of this, we have a continuous supply of impoverished and trapped working class people that have no way of climbing in the ranks of the trickle down, trickle down economy. They literally can't do it. This gives us a continuous stream of working class blue collar individuals in the United States. We are out of time, but TLDR, the war on drugs has failed. Thank you guys, I will see you next Tuesday and we'll resume a regular schedule and we only have a couple of classes left at this point. I think we have seven. See you guys later. Thanks, Diego. Bye.